the Stonehouse Bell and Stewart 10 drivers of the United Square. It's a well-paying job and uh, you're working with different people every day even if you're doing the same job you're sort of doing the, the job changes from day to day and uh, the people change from day to day which is nice variety and uh, plus you get a lot of time off a lot of time to yourself. Well, I mean, it's the, uh, you know, the, for me, it's the freedom of the job to be able to come and go as you please. The variety, lots of variety. You can do something different every day down here. There's lots of benefits to this job. On a sunny day, there's no place better in the world to work. I wouldn't trade this for anything. I love it down here. It's a great job. Well, some of the benefits are it's uh, an enjoyable work and it's a great group of people that you work with and uh, the flexibility, especially when I first started out, uh, not wanting to, to work uh, necessarily a five-day week. The course you are taking today provides you with an awareness of the following key areas of waterfront safety. Rules and regulations pertaining to safety, specific areas of on-the-job safety, lockout tagout procedures, confined space dangers, fall protection, WMIS and MSDS awareness, and some of the proper methods for transporting dangerous goods. This course was designed by the BCMEA and ILWU Canada to prevent further waterfront fatalities. I had the misfortune of about 15 years ago of watching a foreman get killed down here. And uh, just a regular working day, everybody was working safely or so we thought. He got himself in the bite and a machine killed him. Not a pretty sight. And things like that really make you realize how fast things can happen down here. December 63, the end of 63 I came down here and I, I got registered in January 64. Driving winches, I started on, a, uh, on an oil tanker a standard oil tanker. We used to load up here in Burnaby, stand up van. And uh, I was on the winches and uh, I'd just take a lift and holler heads up and take the load down and I just kept going until it bang. And I'd stop and they'd take the change off and they'd say, okay, go ahead on her. And, and you'd go back out on the dock, grab another load. You wouldn't wait for them to say, come on down. You'd just holler heads up and after a while, you know, you bang it down a few times, you'd get an idea when to slow down. So you didn't bang it so hard, you know, but you couldn't see anything. So, so things have changed a lot now. Years ago, the safety rules weren't as good as they are now. <clears throat> we used to, uh, at noon or after work, you know, you wanted to get out of there as soon as you could. So uh, they'd put, a, a guy would come by on a forklift with a board on it and we'd all stand on the board and hang on to the machine or each other and we'd go flying down the dock and uh, one guy fell off and ran, ran over them and or ran over him and, and you know killed him. We all want a short day. We all want to get away early you know we do our job as fast as we can and but uh, we've had a lot of guys killed that way and uh, so you want to make sure that your the short day isn't your last day. You know what I mean? Oh, we've seen changes in the equipment that's being used uh, from the early days. Uh, uh, we used to do a lot of hand handling of sacks and frozen fish and crates. Uh, nowadays, uh, more and more things are uh, containerized or palletized. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, robots that, that were used in the 70s, a so-called robot uh, that eliminated the need for as many uh, sling people on the, on the, uh, on the dock. And, and people down below. Uh, we've seen uh, the uh, advent of RTGs and more uh, radio frequency devices that, that track the cargo. Uh, we've seen bigger cranes, bigger equipment. And it was all done by hand. Every stick was put on that ship by hand. Every stick from the bottom up, 
to the deck, and then a deck load on top. Everything done by hand, no machines at all. So it took a lot of men, and it was a lot of work, you know, but I guess it was the same in most industries, and it was all, everything was done by hand. So now it's highly mechanized, and uh, it's unbelievable. The most significant changes, I guess, have been with uh, the automation, uh, mechanization changes. Uh, when I first started, we had no lift trucks. We didn't have any containers or those kinds of things. All these big dock entries, they didn't exist then. So the type of equipment, the size of equipment, uh, the uh, uh, cargos were all loaded by hand uh, when we first started, the first 10 years I was here. Uh, everything was loaded by hand, every stick of lumber was loaded by hand, every piece of steel was loaded by hand, everything that was loaded was either in a bag or uh, uh, as a loose cargo. Now everything is done with machines, it's not done physically. The physical labor has been taken out and replaced by uh, equipment. That's absolutely the biggest change. Uh, I was first president here in 1982. I was seven years uh, as a union official at that time. I was president 91, 92 again. Uh, and then I've returned to this job uh, just over three years ago and I've served as president uh, from that time. People, particularly my age group, are probably as more vulnerable than some of our new people because they, uh, uh, people like myself take a lot for granted. We think we already know all the dangers and we don't. Uh, we become complacent sometimes. But I think the work experience has been the biggest reason that we stay safe. Uh, we know where the dangers are. We know what to do. Uh, we've been to a lot of safety courses and we've, you know, we're very experienced in the workplace. So uh, that helps, I think, a lot uh, to make sure that we don't uh, have those types of hazards. Uh, there's only been one instance where uh, a buddy died up in Rupert when a, um, the boom fell down. The wire on the boom was uh, chafing through and it uh, broke and the boom just came right down on the hatch where he was and he was standing just outside the hatch on deck and the boom just landed right on top of him and killed him instantly. But that's the only, pretty well the only fatality I've ever seen on the waterfront, luckily. So. It was one of the crew, the gangplank, uh, telescoping gangplank that slid together and his legs went in between and almost amputated them. Yes, I personally have investigated nine fatalities, and that included at times going and inf informing the family that there's a deceased person in the workplace. And then I've carried on the investigations where I've had to appear at the coroner's inquest and uh, be uh, a witness uh, on representing the union. July of 93, when I first started down here, I'd only been down here two years. Um, we had a situation on a barge over at the uh, La Pointe van term. I was informed that there was two guys down on the barge. Uh, I was in the lunchroom and I went down there right away to see if there was anything I could do. When I got there, I saw the two guys down on the hold. Uh, they were passed out. Um, had no idea why, had no clue as to confined space at that time what the situation was. Um, I stuck my head in there, I could not smell anything, I could not see any gases or anything like that, and uh, I just thought to myself, there's no way I'm going down there if I see two guys lying down there. First aid came, um, all I knew him by was the name Mo, uh, and he had uh, uh, had a small oxygen bottle and uh, I asked him if he wanted any help down below, if I could help him in any way, and he said no, he'd be fine. Uh, he went down in the hold, I watched him go down and he said, would you please go up on the dock and watch for the ambulance to come. I went from the barge up to the dock, I saw my fellow worker up there and I said, uh, can you flag the ambulance over in this direction when you see him? And I went back down to the barge and in that time the first aid attendant, Mo, had passed out. Um, and I shouted up to Glenn, I says, you won't believe this. And he said, what? And I said, the first aid attendant has passed out. And he says, well, what are we gonna do now? And I said, I don't know, but we ain't going down in there. We, we radioed for the compressor truck, it came down. We started blowing cr compressed air in there. And uh, two of the uh, fellows became conscious at that time, um, but had no clue of where they were. 
it was just you could see movement out of him at that point uh, I think it was probably 20 minutes before uh, the fire trucks showed up and uh, they came to the situation and I just stepped back and uh, they assessed it quickly and they could not fit through the hatch with their their oxygen pack on so the guy he started going down the ladder and they were going to hand the oxygen pack to him and as he was going down the ladder they were pushing the oxygen pack down and he was trying to push it back up he came up as quick as he was going down and when he came out his face was beet red uh, and he was gasping for air uh, finally they gave uh, an extension to the oxygen uh, so he could wear his uh, mask and go down and uh, after that uh, he was able to work down there for a while and brought out and rescued the workers. I'd never been involved in anything like this before in my life. Um, it was a real eye-opener to me. Um, I, I'm very cautious now uh, of going into any confined space, uh, especially if I know it's been closed for a certain amount of time. Uh, I just am very cautious about it. It's not like other jobs where you might get a little bump in the head or things like that. Things that we, we move around here, there's weight and there's danger. I guess that term came uh, mainly from working on ships with the, with the wires running like this through blocks and uh, things like that and uh, that was the bite of the of the line but uh, nowadays I guess they refer to it <clears throat> as anywhere you could uh, you may get hurt. But we still have a problem with people down below being in the wrong place, standing in the wrong place uh, where they can get hit with loads or uh, hit with incoming uh, um, missiles so to speak that may fall off of loads and uh, people still are in danger quite a bit. Definition of the bite is when you're putting yourself into an area that a hazard can happen, an incident can happen, where an injury can happen. Almost anything that's moving, uh, you can put yourself in the bite of any moving object around here. Uh, although we have a very good safety record on the west coast of Canada, uh, compared to longshoring anywhere else in North America. Uh, but people still have to be very aware because when accidents happen, they tend to be very severe. Well, when I was uh, coming up as a young fella, we hopped on a forklift. And then we would go in and say, hey, I've, I've driven a forklift, give me a rating. And that's how I got my rating. And then once you got your lift truck rating, you were expected to operate everything that had a steering wheel. Today, it has changed dramatically. We use every tool that we can get our hands on. Uh, we use the classroom situation, manuals, videos. We use PowerPoint presentations. And we also have for the RTG dock gantry, ship gantry and pedestal crane, the simulators. Uh, these uh, two simulators that you have right here, they are the state-of-the-art type of system and we are in the process of upgrading them for two, we're buying two new ones in the very near future. We can put the person directly in the crane with the instructor and he can go directly in production because the simulator does all this. With the introduction of uh, trainers, uh, for, for instance, on the log jobs, uh, we've cut down significantly on the number of accidents. And the introduction of uh, trainers on the steel jobs, putting out trainers with the individual gangs, uh, we've uh, um, cut the number of accidents from, I believe it was uh, uh, 34 major accidents in, in uh, 2004 to only two in 2005. And while two is too many, it is certainly a, a great improvement over what was in the past. Traditionally, the use of fall protection may have been kind of secondary in the longshore industry. But it's been my experience in my two or three years of working with the longshore at 
with the longshore industry in the lower mainland area where there's been an active uh, participation in the longshore industry to introduce fall protection in the workplace. The longshore industry is among probably uh, some of the, one of the highest uh, risk areas when it comes to falling from elevation. Not only because of the severity and the height uh, where workers are exposed to falls, but also to the frequency of exposure. Certainly the individuals that must maintain uh, the, the lifting equipment, I'm talking about the dog side gantries, rubber tire gantries, rail mounted gantries and such, uh, certainly do uh, have a frequent exposure to, to falls. Uh, but certainly the people that work in the lashing, uh, the lashing of the ships, um, the unlocking of the, uh, of the stackers uh, at the top of the stacks on the ships themselves, certainly people of that nature, logging ship operations, have the greatest, greatest amount of exposures, exposures to falls. But the thing is, the thing is, it's not necessarily, in some cases, the frequency. It's the one-time severity that they're exposed to. One slip and one trip can lead to a fatality. Ladder safety is the start in a fall protection program. What we work from, what we use to access the work location, is part of fall protection. So therefore, ladder safety is every bit as important as the harness and the lanyard and the anchorage we may use in a fall restraint or a fall arrest system. Well, one of the, uh, one of the areas of, of concern anytime people use ladders, and there's a number of reasons why people have falls from ladders. Uh, number one, condition of the ladder. Number two, the grade of the ladder. Number three, the use of the ladder. And most of us use ladders in some, in some cases, and we're all guilty of it at one time in our lives or not, of things more than what they were originally designed for. One of the most frequent things that people use ladders for is to work when really a ladder, in most cases, extension ladders and fixed length ladders were designed for access. But one of the biggest exposures we have from the ladder is improper angle, improper placement and securement of the ladder, but the failure to maintain three points of contact while climbing the ladder. When we talk about the failure of three points of contact, basically we're talking about having a grip on the ladder of two feet and one hand, or two hands and one foot at all times on the ladder. I think one of the leading causes for people not to use fall protection in any industry and not just along shore is people's failure to recognize the hazard. So the first thing is, is to ask, is to ask, when is fall protection required? And secondly, if I don't know, I don't go. The bottom line is everybody wants to go home at the end of the day, at the end of the shift. If a person comes out and says to me, I've been working 30 years, I've never used fall protection before. I climb on top of all kinds of containers and cranes and I'm still going home every day. All right, they say, we don't, I don't require fall protection. I say, well, you're relying on a four letter word um, and that's luck. I said, because if you haven't actively done something to protect your safety and health, then it's only luck that you go home every day. I actually have five of my adult children. My wife and I have seven adult children. Five of them do work here. Uh, four of them are males, one's a female, and at home we talk to them all the time about safety. The biggest thing we tell them is never to walk under loads. Do not stand under loads. Uh, always try to find the safest spot uh, as you're uh, loading or unloading cargo. Uh, we tell them when they're working on the dock not to get in between lift trucks and loads so they don't get run over, they don't get hit with forks or uh, flying uh, objects. And we try to tell them always to be aware of their environment and the dangers that are there. We got a pensioners club here, about 100 people, 80, 90 uh, or so come uh, to our, our meetings here the first of the month, the first Thursday of every month. And a lot of old timers here, 70s, 80s, well into their 80s. So, um, it's good to see them, that they all uh, survive, but a lot of those young guys, they're, they're not going to make it. Uh, it's sad to say, but it's true. There's a lot of, of people get hurt or die before they get their pensions. So tell them to look after themselves. Nobody else is going to do it for you. <laughs>